Hello, everybody. Hope you all are having a good weekend. Uh, yeah, Raw vs. SmackDown. Raw closed the gap a little bit, uh, which is good to see. I, I wonder if that will be the pattern moving forward, where SmackDown will be the more consistent show week to week, but Raw will, like, start strong uh, in the post-pay-per-view show, because that's been the pattern so far, is that um, the night after Battleground, Raw was very good, and SmackDown was kind of okay, but as the weeks went on, Raw got terrible, SmackDown stayed fairly consistent, while not great, was the more watchable of the two shows, and, uh, looks like, um, you know, the, the same thing is kind of repeating itself, where night after SummerSlam, Raw was at least very memorable, um, SmackDown not so much, so I wonder, again, we'll find out next week how everything plays out, but I just think that's really interesting that that's how it's played out so far. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, before I jump into the classic match reviews, uh, that I'm doing in this video, uh, which is the main purpose of this video, um, I, I do want to go back to my SummerSlam 2016 review a little bit and cover some things that I did not cover in that video, so this is kind of an add-on, um, an addendum, if you will, uh, to that review. Um, when I posted the review to SummerSlam, I actually, as I mentioned in the video, I had avoided the internet and I avoided all reviews of the show because I didn't want to have it spoiled for me. Um, because of the way my schedule worked out, you know, I missed ROH and NXT, and then I missed the first hour of SummerSlam, and I basically just had to play catch-up, uh, for like a three or four day span. Um, so I stayed away from the internet, stayed away from all reviews of the show. I was shocked to find out that I, uh, my review was one of the more positive ones. <laughs> I was like, wow, I was actually the nice guy for once, who'd have thought? Um, yeah, and... I fully recognize that the show has a lot of dead weight on it, and that's, yeah, I mean, there's like 15 matches, and maybe three or four of them are are worth anything, <laughs> you know, worth watching or did anything cool. Um, and, you know, the opening tag was all right. Um, on the pre-show, Cesaro versus Sheamus was okay. Uh, Charlotte and Sasha was pretty good. Um, then AJ and Cena was very good. You had Rollins and Balor, which I, I, I got to cover something with Rollins and Balor in a minute. But And I liked Orton and Lesnar for what it was. It's not, you know, match of the year or anything like that. But um, I, I did enjoy it for what it was. But, um, yeah, most of the reviews for SummerSlam were fairly lukewarm and negative, and I was one of the nicer ones. So I think I'm going to chalk that up to me being so happy that AJ Styles beat Cena clean that I was just happy for the rest of the show. <laughs> and I was just okay with it. Um, like I said, it's uh, the show was way too long, and had the that's a problem it shared with WrestleMania 32, but it was nowhere near as, as soul-sucking as WrestleMania 32 was. I'm still like... I, I felt like a little piece of my soul die <laughs> towards the end of WrestleMania 32. It was just so fucking long. Um, like, I, I rewatched um, Ben-Hur a couple of days ago, and I can't believe I have to make this distinction. I watched the 1959 version of Ben-Hur, the, the one that won all the awards and got the reputation for being one of the most important films ever made. Yeah, that one. Um, not this pointless remake that is... I, I don't even know why it exists. But anyway, I, I went back and I rewatched Ben-Hur. That movie is like four hours long. SummerSlam is, was even longer than that, I think, uh, when you take the, the kickoff show into account. So, um, yeah, these pay-per-views are getting really, really long. And I don't know if WWE should, like... I don't know. They're they're always expanding their content, and to me, it's like, guys, you really need to cut back. You really need to cut back. But, because it's just too much. But, um... <clears throat> But yeah, uh, Balor versus Rollins. I did want to touch up on that uh, as well. Um, I found out that the fans chanted during the match, this belt sucks. And I didn't bring it up in my review because I could not make out what they were chanting. And I forgot to make a note of it uh, uh, in my review. I remember them chanting something. And I, for whatever reason, I guess I went temporarily deaf. But I could not make out what they were chanting. So I didn't really think anything of it. So I didn't realize they were saying that the new belt uh, really sucks. Um, my take on it, it does. It's lazy as shit. It's just the WWE world title painted red. I, it's, it's lazy as fuck. And actually I could, you know, I could assign that same criticism to the new SmackDown titles that were created, the new, uh, tag team titles and the new women's title over there. And it's like, it's just the, the old title belts, but they're blue. It's like, <laughs> it's like come on guys. Can we, Get a little bit more creative than that. And I, I can tell already, it's like, all right, they're probably going to paint the IC title blue, and they're probably going to paint the U.S. title red, and they're probably going to, 
um, paint the WWE title blue, and it's like, whatever. I mean, the women's title on Raw is already red, so it's white and red, but, um, yeah, uh, so, yeah, it, the new belt designs are very, very lazy, because they're literally just changing the color, and to me, if you want Raw and SmackDown to have their own identities, um, having the exact same looking title belts, um, I mean, if you're colorblind, the belts look exactly the same, so, you know, it's not a very good design. Um, it's, it's just very, very lazy. Um, are they the worst? I mean, is the Universal title belt the worst design ever? Is the, the new SmackDown Women's title or the new tag titles the worst design ever? No, uh, I've seen worse. Uh, off the top of my head, there was the Divas title, that butterfly-looking thing that looked like... Uh, I'm not even <laughs> sure how to describe it. It, it. it looked like a drag queen ate a bunch of glitter and then vomited all over the belt, and that's what you got. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's no other way I can describe it. It was just the ugliest-looking thing I've ever seen. Uh, the Jeff Hardy TNA World title, that thing was hideous. Um, I, I mean, I said it looked like something that belonged in an 80s cartoon like E-Man or Thundercats. It just looked, it looked atrocious. Uh, and, I, of course, the spinner belt, uh, John Cena's great contribution to the WWE title. I hated that fucking thing, as most of us did. That thing looked like an eight-year-old designed it, and it was like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it looked like something that an eight-year-old would design. I'm shocked it didn't have, like, light-ups and, you know, uh, pyros and shit, like, Fuck, that thing looks stupid. Um, sorry, I'm getting a text. Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, uh, so, yeah, the Universal title, the belts, the belt design does suck, but it's not the worst thing I've ever seen, so it seems a little weird to me that that's the one that got condemned for the shitty belt design when I can think of uh, quite a few worse ones. Uh, I, no belt will ever be as good as the, the two best wrestling championship belts of all time. Uh, the Winged Eagle uh, WWF title belt that Hogan held in the early 90s, like late 80s, early 90s. And uh, the big gold belt that WCW had, you know, held by Flair and, uh, you know, Sting and all those guys. Um, those are the two best w the two best world championship belts I've ever seen. Um, and the two best belts I've ever seen in the history of wrestling, to be perfectly honest. Um they, they were just, I don't know why, uh, especially the big gold belt in its simplicity just looks like a perfect championship belt. Uh, the winged eagle belt looks so regal and so prestigious just by, like, you knew it was the biggest belt in the company just by the way it looked. Um, and, you know, belt designs haven't been as good since then, but uh, I, I wasn't a fan of the smoking skull belt. I thought that thing looked kind of silly, but... Uh, yeah, but at least it made sense. It's like, yeah, Austin would wear something like that if you're going to design your own personal belt. It's like, I, I guess that's where the spinner belt and the Jeff Hardy belt kind of get some defense. It's like, yeah, the guy's wearing it. That's the type of thing that those, those guys would wear. <laughs> but, um, in any case, uh, yeah, so those are my little add-ons to my SummerSlam review. Just wanted to clarify those and explain why I didn't mention the Universal title belt and the fans' negative reaction to it. Because I didn't realize that that's what they were doing because I'm assuming I went temporarily deaf. And I also wanted to, uh, come on here and say that it, uh, I was kind of surprised that I was one of the nicer reviews to the show. <laughs> um, but, eh, you know. Um, but in any case, let's get on to the classic match reviews that I did. Uh, once again, thank you everybody that voted in the polls that I posted on Twitter. The two winning matches were, um, and like I said, the theme was Bret Hart SummerSlam matches because Bret Hart, to me, had an excellent body of work at SummerSlam. Uh, you know, for all the talk that Shawn Michaels is Mr. WrestleMania, and it's entirely justified based on the quality of work uh, that he uh, gave us at WrestleMania. Um, Shawn Michaels had the best matches, the best body of work in WrestleMania history. I felt the same way about Bret Hart for SummerSlam. It just seemed, I, I don't know why, but at SummerSlam, Bret Hart always seemed to leave a mark or steal the show or have some kind of an excellent match or, or something. He just always seemed to shine at SummerSlam, even if it was singles or tag. Uh, you know, some of the matches with the Hart Foundation were very good as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, the way I structured it was, it was going to be one of the more commonly celebrated ones, um, and I had that down to Mr. Perfect at 91, Bulldog at 92, and Owen Hart in the Steel Cage at 94. Owen Hart in the Steel Cage was the winner of that poll, and the other poll was kind of the, not brought up as much Bret Hart SummerSlam matches, uh, ones that I think are very good for one reason or another, 
uh, but don't uh, get a lot of recognition compared to the other, the other three matches that I just listed. And the matches I selected for that were Hart Foundation versus Demolition from 1990, uh, Bret Hart versus Jerry Lawler from 93, and Bret Hart versus Undertaker from 97. And the winner of that poll, not surprisingly, uh, given the names that were involved, um, Bret Hart versus The Undertaker in 1997. So uh, let's get into the, the 94 match first. Let's go chronologically here. Why not? Seems to make sense. So... Uh, Bret Hart versus Owen Hart in a steel cage match at 1994. Um, Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, uh, for me, was the best feud of 1994. I loved the storyline. I loved the feud. I loved uh, Owen Hart's character development from um, the younger brother of Bret Hart to being this jealous, bitter, um, you know, uh, wrestler who, uh, you know, any fan watching Owen could tell that he was very talented, but he just couldn't reach the same level of success as Bret. And uh, it, was, it seemed like a very natural storyline to do. And Owen really came into his own uh, through the course of the storyline and developed beautifully. Uh, turning into this great kind of whiny crybaby heel, but also keeping this intensity and, and being a legitimate threat to Bret Hart. And how they established him as a threat to, to Bret, uh, don't mean to rhyme there, but... Uh, they had him go over Bret clean at WrestleMania 10, And I was like, oh my god. When Owen beat him... I was shocked. Uh, that was one of those, like, okay, because going into it, I kind of figured that Brett was going to win the title by the end of the night, and I just assumed he was going to win both matches. He was going to beat Owen and then move on to beat Yokozuna. But when he lost to Owen, I was legitimately surprised. And then when Brett won the title from Yokozuna later in the show, and you had that stare down between Owen and Brett, you just knew that it's like, well, Owen's going to get a title shot. He has to. I mean, he's he beat the champion. Um, he beat Bret Hart right before he became the champion. So... He's got to be in line for a title shot. Uh, Owen uh, then got built up to King of the Ring 1994. Uh, uh, I should also note that at King of the Ring 93, Bret Hart won the King of the Ring tournament. And now it was Owen's turn to kind of repeat Bret's success by winning the King of the Ring tournament. And he did so, uh, defeating Razor Ramon in the finals. And with the help of Jim the Anvil Neidhart, who turned heel and aligned himself with Owen Hart, uh, kind of re revealing his own uh, professional jealousy towards Bret that he was the big success from the Hart Foundation and uh, Anvil wasn't allowed to uh, share in the spotlight as much. So again, that was actually a nice layer to the story that they uh, there was another Hart that felt slighted uh, by Bret Hart's success, and it was Jim. And um, I, I thought that was a very good development. It also gave Owen Hart a heavy. It gave him like a thug to be in his corner and help him out. And... Um, uh, do you know and, and all the benefits that go along with that kind of like what diesel was for Shawn michaels in a lot of ways although that that partnership didn't work out nearly as well it worked well in the short term um so yeah we get to SummerSlam and it's decided that they're going to face each other in a steel cage uh mainly to quote keep the family out so i assume that to prevent jim neidhart from interfering and to prevent the other hart brothers from going crazy and jumping in themselves um, Bret Hart and Owen Hart were going to have to face each other in a steel cage match uh, with the WWF title on the line. And it's like, that's how you do a fucking rematch, okay? You don't just do the rematch right after you do the match the first time. You build up to the rematch so that you have enough time to raise the stakes. Uh, Bailey and Asuka from the last TakeOver special, even though uh, I was disappointed with how the match itself turned out, the build-up was great because Bailey was like, all right, I want to get back in line to title contention. Uh, Asuka beat me for the title, and now I want to get back into the hunt. And she got injured by Nia Jax and had to go into the road to recovery and um, had to work her way to eventually get a title shot against uh, Asuka again to set up the rematch. So uh, there was character development, there were story developments along the way to get to the rematch. They didn't just do the rematch two weeks later on Raw or they didn't wrestle each other in tag matches 45 times leading into the next match. It was, um, they kept them apart from each other and made the rematch feel even more special and um, as good as the WrestleMania 10 match is, uh, this match felt even bigger because now you've got the WWF title on the line and Owen has been built up even more with the King of the Ring victory and Jim Neidhart in his corner and all these other things. So um, everything that's on the line here feels even bigger and the stage feels even bigger and um, the match feels more significant as a result. Now, why they weren't allowed to close out the show is anyone's guess. Uh, anybody who remembers that particular pay-per-view, they closed out with... Undertaker versus Undertaker, which was a flop. Uh, to, I'm putting it mildly. I mean, that, that match was a disaster in many ways. Uh, you, you got one cool entrance from The Undertaker, but other than that, uh, the match was a flop. And um, I, I often wondered why they didn't just close with the Steel Cage match. I just don't. And yeah, the only thing I can think of is that 
Vince, especially back then, had this thing that he had to send the fans home happy. And even though Brett ultimately won the cage match, uh, the match ended with Owen and Jim beating him up inside the cage and, you know, knocking the hearts off the cage to keep them from helping him and all these other things. So the heels kind of stood tall, even though uh, Bret Hart kept the title. So I think Vince wanted uh, wanted to end the show on a good note by having Undertaker go over and establish himself as the one true Undertaker. And I, I think that was the thought process, because he used to do that a lot back in the day. It's That's why Hogan versus Taker at Survivor Series 91 came, like, less than halfway through the show and the closing match was LOD and Big Boss Man versus Natural Disasters and IRS with LOD being the sole survivors. Um, as terrible as it was, Vince's mindset was, no, we got to send the fans home happy. So, uh, which I think is kind of dumb. I think, um, you know, uh, putting the heels in command of the show at the end, that's where you get the greatest intrigue and you get these great cliffhangers. It's like, oh my God, I want to see what happens next. Uh, fortunately, the Attitude Era was a little bit more mindful of that, which is why the Attitude Era was more successful. One of the reasons that the Attitude Era was more successful. But um, uh, but yeah, uh, this match absolutely should have been the main event uh, just because of the story and the developments and the, the stakes and the prize that was on the line and all the personal grudges uh, going into it. And giving the match a rewatch, I have to say, it holds up very, very well. I think it's, uh, it often gets hailed as the greatest steel cage match of all time. And as long as you stick strictly to steel cage matches and not include, like, Hell in a Cell or Elimination Chambers or anything like that, um, I think it might be. I, I think it's, it's very high up there, at least. Um, I can't think of too many other cage matches that are on par with it, to be perfectly honest. Um... Maybe, like, maybe AMW and Triple X from uh, TNA, uh, Turning Point 2004, the Six Sides of Steel match that they had. But um, this match, uh, Bret Hart said it best in his book. He said, I don't know if it's the best cage match of all time, but it's the best cage match without blood. And that's a very interesting distinction because there was no blood in this match, which, you know, back then you expect a steel cage match to be just a blood fest, and this one wasn't. Um, what they did was... Uh, Kind of played, they played to their athletic strengths where Owen was like, had these cat-like reflexes where he was jumping all over the place trying to get out of the door or uh, scale the cage or whatever to try and get out. So he was like really quick. So Brett had to keep him grounded because Owen was just constantly trying to get out of the cage. Um, and it's like if Owen was able to get away just once, the match would be over because he was so fast and so quick and so mindful of where the cage was, where the door was and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, that... Um, it created kind of a fast-paced match with a lot of, I guess you could say, near falls uh, for a steel cage match. One other thing I love about this, I'll bring this up too. One other, other thing I loved about this match is that uh, one of my criticisms of cage matches have been that um, I think it should either be pinfall and submission or escape the cage. It shouldn't be both because doing both um, creates too many contradictions. It's like, well, why didn't you pin him when you could have? Uh, when you could have pinned him instead, why did you climb out the cage instead? Or you know, why Why are you jumping off the cage when you can just escape or whatever? Um, those type of psychology problems that come about with that type of rule structure. This match, the only rules were escape the cage. So it, none of that was really there. So you got this one sequence late in the match that was very good where Owen locked Brett in the sharpshooter and then Brett was able to counter it because that was another uh, big part of their whole feud was that Owen claimed that he invented the sharpshooter and that he taught it to Brett. Uh, neither one is true. <laughs> like, that hold existed long before it was taught, before Brett even used it. It was the Scorpion Deathlock. And according to Brett, it was Conan who taught him how to do it. Um, but anyway, uh, it was kind of like, yeah, Owen locked the sharpshooter on Brett, but Brett, being the true master of the hold and being the babyface of the match, was able to counter it and uh, reverse it and uh, lock the sharpshooter in on Owen. And uh, another thing I really loved about this match... Um, Aside from all the crazy bumps they took, I mean, they took a top row, a top of the cage superplex spot, which, as I talked about in the Hulk Hogan Big Boss Man steel cage match, that spot's just insane. I, I there's not enough money on this planet to get me to do something like that. But, um, uh, but one other thing I loved, uh, this is another one of the matches that I used to uh, highlight why I prefer the big blue bars or like the big uh, iron grid uh, for the steel cage rather than the, the chicken wire or the, the steel mesh or whatever you want to call it. Uh, um, I prefer the big iron bars because you can do more with it and that really rang true with the finish where Brett and Owen are racing each other outside the cage. They're both on the 
outside. They're climbing down on the outside, and it's just kind of a race to the finish. They're fighting each other on the wall, and it's like, oh, God, if one of them drops, it's over. And you get to this point where um, Owen gets his legs locked in the steel cage, and he's hanging upside down, which allows Brett to climb out and win. Um, you couldn't do that spot on the, the cyclone fence. You, that can only be done with the big iron bars, and that's one of the reasons I prefer that type of stuff. I felt like you could be more creative with it, and it was, it was examples like that. Um, again, I've heard people prefer the cyclone fence, and that's I understand why, uh, but I feel like the big iron bars just created more creativity, or more potential for creativity, if that makes any sense. So, um, yeah, the match was great. Uh, another thing that's worth bringing up is that uh, I mentioned Jim Neidhart. Uh, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, also made his return to the WWF in this match. He was in the crowd with his wife, Diana, uh, watching the match and cheering on Brett. And then Jim Neidhart attacked him after Brett won uh, so that he couldn't interfere and that he could throw Brett back into the steel cage so Owen and Jim could beat him up. And Jim actually chained the, the door of the cage shut. And then you had this great visual of Owen and Jim just beating down Bret Hart's side of the cage. And all the Hart brothers and Davy Boy are cl trying to climb... Uh, up the cage to get inside and stop Jim Neidhart and Owen, but they kept knocking them off the walls. But eventually there were too many Hart brothers uh, for all of them to fight off, and uh, Jim and Owen had to you know, climb out of there and get away while the, the Hart family helped Brett. So, um, yeah, it all of it I thought was done very, very well. Uh, just an excellent match. Uh, there's that part of me that kind of wishes that Owen had gone over, just to kind of give Owen like that big main event run and uh, eventually create a rematch between the two heading into WrestleMania or something like that. But the storyline would continue later in the year, as I've already talked about the Bob Backlund Bret Hart um, submission match from Survivor Series '94, which is an uh, another one of my personal favorites. But yeah, this match was uh, this steel cage match was terrific. It's an excellent steel cage match and a, really a great example of what you can do with a steel cage. Um, and it's also, you know, an indicator of what you can do when you really take the time to develop your story and develop your characters. It really makes the matches mean that much more. And this match really, really benefited from a really strong storyline and the right characters in the right place uh, to make it all happen. And, and they created magic. Now let's close this thing out by talking about Bret Hart versus The Undertaker from SummerSlam 1997 with the WWF Championship on the line. Uh, but first, a little backstory. Uh... These two actually wrestled each other before at a major pay-per-view, Royal Rumble 1996. And as a young child, I was 11 year I was going to be 11 years old. I was, uh, you know, March 20th is my birthday, and that was January 96, so I was almost 11. And um, at that point, Bret Hart and The Undertaker were my two favorite wrestlers in the, w in the WWF at that point. So I was really excited for that match. To me, it was like... Hogan Warrior all over again. It wasn't in the grand scheme of things, but to me, to my 11-year-old self, it was like Hogan Warrior all over again. And <clears throat> I was really disappointed with the match. It was one of the first times I remember being really, really disappointed with a match. And I've gone back and rewatched it before, and yeah, the match is not very good. I think part of it is because they had to follow the Royal Rumble match. Um, but for whatever reason, they just did not click in this match. I don't know what it was, but... Uh, I thought the match was very dull, very boring, very long, and just, just never ending. <laughs> it just, um, it just wasn't very good. And, um, you expect much better from those two. Uh, especially with the title on the line and the main event of a major pay-per-view, you expect it to be great, and it wasn't even close. Um, but, get to SummerSlam 1997, they've got a chance to make up for it. It's their second pay-per-view match together. Um, things are very different this time around. Uh, Bret Hart is now a major heel, leading the Hart Foundation, their whole uh, pro-Canada, fuck America uh, deal, which was very good and very well done. I've talked about it before, how anti-American gimmicks kind of bore me. That's really only if they're, like, one-dimensional. It's like, oh, I'm from Finland and I hate America because I'm foreign. Um, with Bret, this was a guy that felt jaded, felt like the American fans had turned his back on them, um and had grown increasingly frustrated with how he was treated in the WWF. Um, and it all culminated at WrestleMania 13, where he ultimately turned heel, and you got that excellent submission match with uh, Steve Austin. But, um, yeah, so it felt natural from the character to feel the way that he did and to develop the way that it did, so the whole storyline felt very good. And as has been pointed out before, it created this great dynamic where 
He was a heel in America, but everywhere else around the world, uh, Bret Hart was a baby face. And it's like, okay. <laughs> Go to Europe, he's loved. Go to Canada, obviously he's a megastar and a hero. Go to America, everybody fucking hates him. And it's like, that's a great dynamic. And I don't know if you could ever pull that off again. But, um... But yeah, you get to this this match, and Bret Hart is sworn if he does not defeat The Undertaker for the WWF title, he will never wrestle in America again. <coughs> now, to add on top of that, The Undertaker had won the WWF title at WrestleMania 13. Uh, many saying that that's the night Bret Hart should have won the WWF title from Shawn Michaels in a repeat of WrestleMania 12. That's... Neither here nor there. Uh, the Sid Undertaker match that resulted from uh, the whole confusion, the whole debacle, and Sean losing his smile, and them just not knowing what the fuck they're doing was a bore fest and one of the worst main events in WrestleMania history. And unfortunately, it kind of tainted Undertaker's big moment because it's like, all right, Undertaker's winning the title. That should be pretty cool. But the match was so bad that it kind of rained on the parade a little bit. And then the resulting title reign from Undertaker was kind of... I don't want to say it was bad, but it wasn't. It wasn't the the show, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, the more interesting stuff on the show was the Austin Brett stuff, uh, and even eventually uh, working Shawn Michaels in with Austin and getting you know playing with the seeds for their eventual rivalry and all those things. That stuff was more interesting to me than whatever Undertaker was doing. Um, it felt like Undertaker didn't really have a whole lot going on other than he was the champion. Uh, the only exception was. Uh, the whole storyline with Paul Bearer revealing that Kane was still alive, and uh, we were all just kind of waiting for Kane. But that doesn't really do much for Undertaker as champion. You're just kind of waiting for Kane to show up. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily make uh, his matches in the meantime any more intriguing. Uh, he wrestled Farouk at King of the Ring, and uh, well, probably the single most obvious outcome in the history of title match, like this side of John Cena. Uh, and his various title matches, I mean, that one was like, gee, I wonder who's going to win that match. Sure enough, Undertaker did. Um, so yeah, um, but you build him up to this point, and it's like, alright, this is actually a very interesting title match, because now Bret Hart, um, is a major heel, and if he loses this match, he's out of, he can't wrestle in America anymore. And then you've got Shawn Michaels thrown in as the guest referee, and if he shows any favoritism towards The Undertaker... He'll be banned from wrestling in America, and of course, Sean had to weasel his way to be the special guest referee. For the first time in his career, Sean gets to referee a match, which would start his long string of being the worst uh, guest referee of all time, because it feels like, and I mean that from a kayfabe standpoint, because it feels like whenever Sean is the guest referee, somebody's getting fucked over, or he tries to fuck somebody over, at least, and... Um, he gets a little too personally invested, and a referee's not supposed to do that, but... Um, in any case, so you've got, like, the Undertaker, Kane, and Paul Bearer stuff heading into this, and then you've got the Hart Foundation and their whole thing heading into this, and then you've got Shawn Michaels and, uh, his whole deal with Brett and how he can't stand Brett, and, uh, that'll eventually lead to SummerSlam, or, I'm sorry, Survivor Series 1997, and it's, uh, everything is shaping up really, really well, and it's like, man, they really created a lot of different storylines and a lot of different, um you know, character paths for these guys. Because there's uh, so many things going on, and actually during the match itself, uh, Brian Pillman and Jim Neidhart came out to the ring, um, showing solidarity with Brett and, and the Hart Foundation, and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, uh, Paul Bearer came out at one point just to taunt Undertaker, and, uh, so there were a lot of different characters involved in this, too. Um, and the match itself turned out, you know, was very, very good, and rewatching it again, I thought the match was very, very good, uh, mainly because of all the storyline implications going in with the match. It was nice to see Undertaker and Brett actually have a very good pay-per-view match. Uh, Brett even said in his book that um, his matches with Undertaker in 97 were the last great matches of his time in the WWF, and uh, I thought they did a fantastic job here as well. Uh, it had the big match feel. Uh, you got to that one spot where Brett locked in the sharpshooter and then Undertaker powered out of the sharpshooter, which no one had ever done before. At least I don't think anyone had ever done it before uh, prior to that. It's one of those fact check things. If anybody knows any better, please let me know. I mean, Yokozuna got out of it at WrestleMania 9, but that was because Fuji threw salt in Brett's eyes. Um, you know, stuff like that. But um, 
But yeah, uh, I thought the match was very, very good. Uh, great main event worthy match. Um, really a sign of improvement for the WWF because 97, the first half of 97 was really bad for them. So uh, this was a sign that they were really starting to bounce back and starting to get better. And uh, everything culminated with the finish where Bret Hart went to, hit the, went to try and hit The Undertaker with a steel chair. Shawn Michaels stopped him, grabbed the chair. Bret Hart spat on him. Shawn Michaels swung the chair at Brett, Brett ducked, and The Undertaker got waffled with the steel chair. Brett covers Undertaker, and Shawn, realizing that he'll be banned from America if he doesn't count the pin, counts the one, two, three, and Bret Hart is the new champion. Um, now, uh, one of the most memorable parts about the ending here is JR's commentary when Shawn hit Undertaker with the chair. JR seemed to be the only person, and I love you, JR, I really do. But JR seemed to be the only person that didn't get it. Uh, he even said it. It's like, I don't understand that. Why'd he hit The Undertaker with the chair? I don't get it. I don't understand. And Vince and Lawler on commentary are trying to explain it. It was like, he was trying to hit Brett, and Brett ducked, and Undertaker got waffled. It's like, but I don't understand that. Um, it's like, JR, he wasn't trying to hit Undertaker. Um, but then he counted the pin when he realized, it's like, oh god, I'm fucked if I don't count this pin. Um... Personally, what I would have said is, what the fuck is a referee doing swinging a steel chair in the first place and influencing the outcomes of matches? It's uh, Sean should have been banned from America just for swinging the steel chair at all. Uh, <laughs> you know? Um, but, yeah. Um, but the good thing that came out of this, uh, first of all, I want to make this point. That chair shot was so well-timed between all three of them, between Sean um, swinging the chair and Brett ducking and Undertaker taking the chair shot... All of it was very well timed. It's like, man, if you're a half second off on any of those, like that whole spot could have been fucked up. So, uh, that's those are some of the little things that great workers do that tend to go unnoticed. But I thought the timing of that whole bit was uh, just about as close to perfect as you could possibly get. So, uh, kudos for that, obviously. And um, <coughs> excuse me. And. Uh, yeah, uh, we get the finish. Bret Hart's now the champion, which puts him on the path to ultimately face Sean. But in the meantime, we're going to get Sean and Undertaker, which resulted in the Ground Zero match and the Bad Blood Hell in a Cell match, which is one of the most legendary matches of all time. And then uh, Sean and Bret would eventually face each other at Survivor Series. Although, I, I gotta be honest, I can't tell you what happened at Survivor Series 97. I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's uh, That match is kind of a blur to me. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, but in any case, it's like, yeah, there were strong storylines going into this. And then after it, the storylines developed and evolved even further, so they got a lot more out of it, too. So uh, a lot of stuff came out of it, a lot of great things, and a lot of big and important moments in wrestling history. And this was kind of this, this match was kind of this interesting kind of nexus point where um, everything kind of splintered off and just continued to grow and snowball, snowball and get bigger and bigger and bigger from there. So, uh, yeah, Undertaker and Brett at SummerSlam 97, I think it's a great match, I think it's a great main event, and... Uh, booked wonderfully and uh, really created some big things down the road. So, um, is it one of the best SummerSlam main events? I, I'm trying to think of all of them. I'd say at the very least it's in the top ten. Like, uh, maybe top seven or eight. Uh, I, I really do like the match that much. But, um, yeah, and it was a joy getting to go back and rewatch both of those matches too. The cage match and the undertaker Brett match. Um, both matches still hold up very well. <coughs> And it was a joy getting to watch both of them, and it was a joy getting here to review them both for you. So, that is all I have for now. Um, my next video is actually going to be non-wrestling related. Uh, surprise for everyone. Um, the, uh, the Star Wars videos that I initially promised to begin doing in May or June, and I kept having to put off and put off, I'm finally going to get around to doing them. Um, so, the first Star Wars review I will be doing... Uh, will be coming uh, later next week. It'll be either Tuesday or Wednesday. I'll get that to you. So um, I won't say what I'm reviewing yet. It's one of the novels. That's all you need to know, which doesn't narrow it down at all because there's like 18 dozen novels. But um, I'm going to start off, and that, that'll that hopefully become a monthly thing where I review uh, a Star Wars novel or a comic or something related to it, uh, specifically from the expanded universe, what originally was the expanded universe. Uh, that, that will be... Uh, the crux, uh, the main focal point of, of my Star Wars reviews. But uh, yeah, that one should be coming, like I said, Tuesday or Wednesday. So be on the lookout for that. And if you're interested in listening to me talk about Star Wars, uh, hopefully you'll find that series of videos fun. But 
Uh, that is all I have for you now. Uh, hope you all enjoy what's left of your weekend, and I'll see you all later.